So uh, Dr. Humphreys gave a very nice introduction in the previous session for these two uh, Fung Symposium, and we're very grateful to have Dr. Savio Wu here so, to give no, a, a conclusion. No pressure. No, no pressure at all. No pressure. No pressure at all. So we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Wu. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I, th I thank the organizer for allowing me to share some story today. Um, I, I would venture to say that many of you know Dr. Fong by reading his work. And, uh, but you really don't know Dr. Fong as a person. So, so instead of telling you more, uh, talk more about Dr. Fong's capability and everything else, I like to just present a talk more like a tribute to him, but more importantly, uh, to let you know something about Dr. Fong that you may not know, and you probably won't have the opportunity to know now that he's turning 100 years old. So um, I want to share a story. Uh, I actually asked for more than 15 minutes, but uh, <laughs> Uh, it's how, how are you going to tell some story about someone that you know for 50 years? So, uh, uh, so I, I want to tell some story by more on why, what, and how Funk has made sustaining and impactful contribution. You know, we always think that this day and age, everybody think about how. But to me, the why and the what are much, much more important. And how Fung inspired Todd and Guy colleagues to do the same. Not just write something, publish something, but how really to think about why you want to do what you want to do. And really is to encourage many of you, especially many of you sit here very young, uh, to get to know Dr. Y. C. Fong a little bit. So, Professor Fong is a distinguished scholar. That, I think, is obvious. He's a brilliant researcher. That is also obvious. Uh, but he's a real consummate teacher. Many, some of the speakers he alluded to, that uh, is inspiring. And he is a quintessential leader. That part you may not know as much, which I will expand upon a little bit. And then he's a visionary role model. And that is very personal. Now, when he was only 30-some years old, he published his book called The Theory of Aeroelasticity when he was a professor at Caltech. And to think that only 30-some years old, you can write a book of this magnitude is amazing. And that book actually went to Dover publication. In those days, if you get your book going to soft cover, that means you really made it, okay? <laughs> so he had, his, he had his book at 2002, is in his fifth printing. So, but Eri Lassisi was his calling but his heart was really in biomechanics. So the transition starts out with the book of Foundation Solid Mechanics, which many of us carry around like a Bible. If you want to pass your PhD qualifying exam, you better know that book. Because mm -hmm. if you're not, you're not going to pass. <laughs> then he wrote the book that probably make Dr. Fong really down to more in the undergraduate level, the continuum mechanics book. Then after that, many of you talk about today <coughs> about the biomechanics book, which went to second edition, and then he wrote a series of three books in that, and so on and so forth. And finally, before he retired, he wrote a book called Introduction to Bioengineering. So these are the books that everybody should have. Everybody should, if you really want to know 
Dr. Fong. But he, why do I call him a brilliant researcher? Is because he has a thorough understanding of physics. And he mastered applied mechanics. And those are the reasons why he can become a brilliant researcher. That's why I said it's not about the how. It's about the why and the what. If you have good mastery of these things, you will always ask why and what. So what did he do? Tunnel theory, shapes of red blood cells, those things you read about. Sheet flow, that he spent 30 years working on that, how the lung circulation works. Strain energy density function we heard this morning. And then quasi-linear viscoelastic theory, which I personally use. And I, I taught Steve. Actually, maybe Steve taught me. Uh, uh, and then stress-dependent homeostasis we talked about just a little bit earlier. And then concept of the residual stress you heard about, you learn about, and structural function. And these days, structural function really goes from uh, molecules to organism. Now, by, by structural function, it doesn't really mean it in a biological way, but more in a mechanical way. He's a consummate teacher because in his writing, he taught us the eight essential steps of problem solving in mechanics, in biomechanics. You've got to learn your anatomy, morphology, and then you look, you've got the property of materials, and then you apply, apply laws of physics, apply, get the meaningful boundary conditions, and solve boundary value problem, basically. Uh, perform physiolog then you perform physiological experiments to test these solutions. Now many of us these day we just do experiment. And you when you do that, you only observe fundamental things. You really do not gonna contribute the deep understanding and the application of these things. So those f five steps above are very important. And then you validate, okay? You gotta validate whatever you're doing, experimental, mathematical, computational. Once you validate, then you have the real hammer. You can solve a lot of problems, apply this. Uh. So now I move on to quintessential leader. And that part, I think, will be uh, new to you. Dr. Fong started a Joint Biomechanics Symposium. That's the ASME Joint Biomechanics Symposium. And in 1973, we don't really have a di bioengineering division in ASME. We have human factor division, okay? <laughs> but so like he himself, and that's when I was his underling at UCSD, starting in 1970. He called me to his office in 1971, 72 time, said, Savio, let's do a biomechanics symposium. And I said, okay. So that's the way I answered to Dr. Fong. Everything he said, I said, okay. <laughs> and when other people at UCSD wanted me to do something, I said, no. <laughs> I'm busy. And then they will go up to Dr. Fong and say, <laughs> and then he came down two days later to my office. The answer is okay. <laughs> so the biomechanics symposium is to create a platform for mechanics aspect of bioengineering. And that wasn't quite there at that time, even though we've been toying biomechanics for a while. So that has become a very successful biannual symposium every summer, okay? And we would have this meeting in the heat of like Atlanta, Georgia, and stuff like that. And, and you sleep in beds of uh, students because there's no support for this kind of meeting. So 
you imagine people like Eric Reisner, uh, 60 some years old, sleeping in a bed, is curved, and he has back problem, but he went, he came. <laughs> so after 20 years, this Joint Biomechanics Symposium became the Summer Bioengineering Conference, which is the predecessor of SB33. So this conference exists because Dr. Fong wanted it to happen in 1973. I don't know how many of you know this story, but anyway, it's important. And also in 1998, in the SB3C, we honor Dr. Fong, celebrate his 80th birthday by a symposium in Big Sky, Montana. Now, uh, actually, that also started a tradition in SBC3, SBC or SBC3, that many people older like us get a symposium, I guess, before you go out to retirement. So the other thing he does as a leader, he did, was that he and John Brighton of Penn State at that time, started the Journal of Biomechanical Engineering, which is the, uh, our flagship journal in the ASME for bioengineering. And uh, this is the first issue, very first issue of the, in 1997, but because ASME is very uh, traditional, so our first volume of the journal is volume 99. Okay, <laughs> and we became a series of uh, series K. So then he wants to bring biomechanics worldwide. So to do that, he created a U.S. National Committee of Biomechanics, USNCB, in 1979. Um, the first international under the auspices of USNCB is the China-Japan-US Conference on Biomechanics in Wuhan, China. And, uh, and actually it was a marvelous meeting and uh, first time the three country <coughs> leaders in this area met together in the East Lake where Chairman Mao used to go and his members, so a very nice place. After that, we actually went to climb the majestic y Yellow Mountain from Wuhan, and uh, it's in Anhui province. So Dr. Fung had knee pain at that time, but you have to climb 8,000 steps, uneven steps up, and 10,000 steps down hill. But after climbing, he said, my, pain, my knee pain's gone. <laughs> now, and I am an expert, supposedly, in knee biomechanics. I have no explanation. <laughs> so this meeting goes on, and I eventually go back to China in 1980, uh, 90s, 1995, I say, uh, 95, 95, 96, in Taiyuan is the fourth meeting and uh, Dr. Fong was there, and there's a nice proceeding uh, of that meeting. And we, by that time, we sh invited Singapore to join us, and Dr. James Guo was the leader of the Singapore team, too. So we have a little, and now it became China, Japan, U.S., Singapore. Another thing going international is that besides just three or four countries, it's going worldwide. That was his plan. So he organized the World Congress of Biomechanics, which you all know. The first meeting was 1990. But the story is not that easy because imagine at that time we already have an International Society of Biomechanics. Mostly people <coughs> involved in uh, sports uh, or physical education and they call us 
oh, you guys just do tissue mechanics. It's nothing. You know, we do this. this. So how dare you call yourself well, Congress? So we negotiated, and uh, uh, we have to ha buy many coffees or cocktail, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> to invite them to to get to do this together. But eventually, uh, it happened, and uh, First World Congress uh, was held in La Jolla, California, of course, um, and uh, I was uh, uh, the program chair, and Jennifer Wayne. Uh, help me, and so we put together a very nice uh, program with other people. And of course, you know that that meeting has grown leaps and bounds. And this year in Ireland, the Eighth World Congress, uh, actually you have something like a more than 4,000 people or something uh, enormous. And I was there, and this is just a small fraction of uh, uh, delegation from China. Then, how do you keep doing this World Congress? <laughs> he decided the best thing to do is do it by World Council. And that's the governing body for the World Congress. And then this is the initial people that are involved in the World Council. Um, and many of them, if in your own respective, receptive, respective country, are really the leaders and pioneers. Now, we do celebrate Dr. Fung's birthday. You know, uh, it's, this is started in s when he was 65 years old, in 1984. And uh, we want to do a special symposium at UCSD at that time. Uh, we called it the Frontier in Applied Mechanics and Biomechanics because we didn't want to exclude his students that were in applied mechanics earlier. And myself, Schmidt Schoenbein, Peter Chen, Michael Yuan, Gene Mead, and several others were uh, just, we were, we don't know what we're really doing, but we, we, we have enthusiasm and energy. Uh, more than 100 people, well known, many of his students, many of his friends came and they, everyone thanked him for his guidance, his mentorship, and his advice. Every one of them. And you know, for us to sit there and say, wow, you know, these people are saying that, just wondering what we need to say. And, uh, but not only that, they all admire his calligraphy, uh, his painting, his stone carving, and even his green stump. So this is a man that not only we can look at him and adore him and, and, and just thinking that how can he does all these things? You know, uh, he, he has tremendous calligraphy. And for those of you who are people from China, you understand calligraphy is very, very important. And his calligraphy is really, really good. And then he paints on top of that. And anyway, a real Renaissance man. So his lifelong collaborator, Dr. Sid Sobin, who's an MD from University of Southern California. He lives in Del Mar, and he works in Southern California. So he wrote in that, at that symposium, the essence of an individual is effervescence, vitality, laugh, and those of you who know Dr. Fong knows his laugh, and spontaneity, spontaneity the center points with, intellectually, so with intellectuality, introspection, intuition, creativity, and so much more, yet clothed with more nobility, humanness, humility, generosity, and integrity. That describes Dr. Fong absolutely. Okay, that describes him absolutely. Now, from this symposium, I want to tell you a little story about the ASMEYC Fong Award. Uh, at, 
we have a listener award at that time, but the, we need an award in Fong's name. The leadership in BED said, we got to do this, but we have no money because ASME takes all our, took all our money. <laughs> we got something like $600 or so in the, in the division. So uh, I was chair of honor com honors committee at that time from 1978 to 1980 something. And then it, they said, okay, Savio, you're the honors chair. That's your job. So, uh, so I said, okay, I got to find, then because the symposium, we collected more money than we spent because we did everything ourselves. I negotiated with the ASME, and I, I don't know whether you have a, in your lifetime, this is not something you really want. This job, somebody asks you to negotiate with ASME, you say, forget it. <laughs> so we saved the funds from, I asked Dr. Peter Chan with Treasurer, that at that time, it takes $5,000 to establish a divisional award. You can, dis you can establish a divisional award. And then Listener was a divisional award. And Al King succeeded me as a, a chair of honors committee. We both conspired, you know, he has to raise $10,000 to raise the Listener to the societal level. And we started the Fung at the divisional level. So the two of us actually, uh, financially, and anyway, we get the money to do these things. And in 1999, the BED finally started to get additional funds thanks to the SBC. And then in 2007, we renamed it as YC Fung Early Career Award. So that's the story of the Fung Award and Medal. Now, to conclude, I'd like to spend a few minutes talk about personal things, because Dr. Fung and I, have for 50 years, have been together. He is my revered mentor. He is my generous colleague, and he's my loving friend. Now, I started UCSD in 1970 uh, to 1990, 20 years. Dr. Fung literally taught me how to be an academician. He taught me how to negotiate a path in academics, which is not easy, uh, especially you're in the Department of Orthopedics. And he and I, for some reason, he likes me. I still don't know why. <laughs> but we have weekly lunch together. Whenever we're in town, we have lunch Friday. So Dr. Fong and I have a many cheeseburgers with French fries and cooked together. And uh, that, with this kind of meeting is so inspiring that you learn how to be a good person. Even a bad person like me <laughs> learn to be good a little bit because the osmosis thing really works. <laughs> When I moved, decided in 1990 to move to Pittsburgh, he gave me his book in a farewell party, and that's what he wrote. And I like, I, I'm going to quote a few of his words. I think that's better than my words. As an older brother, I'd like to give you three parting advices. Slow down to enjoy, detach to preserve perspectives, and take care of your health, health always love YC Fong. Very moving words. And he always praises you, everybody, not just me, lavishly. Words that you really don't, you didn't earn or deserve. He said to me, Dear Savio, I know your first paper, your thesis, it was on cornea and sclera. It was the first paper in biomechanics which treated pressure in an incompressible material correctly. Now, how much, how much can you want? You got words like that for YC, from YC4. Our scientific discoveries during our long collaboration and pioneering work in the years since have accumulated to an extraordinary 
contribution to humanity. Each discovery and each interaction has been personally satisfying. I mean, he is really so generous that putting me at his level, I don't even deserve to be at his hip level, okay? And he's really my loving friend because he says, the personal collection is most precious. How rare is the chance to combine work and friendship so deeply and for so long? We have been blessed with more than our share of harmony and opportunities. Living close by for 20 years enable our families to be fast friends and Bioengineering Conference organizers pick such great venues that our community has remained closed for decades since. That's why, you know, I feel so lucky that I have Dr. Fong as my mentor and friend. So happy 100th birthday, Dr. Fong. You are our 4G man. You are a genius, you are gentle, you are genuine, and you are generous. We respectfully and we fondly call you the father of modern biomechanics. Thank you so very much. So this concludes our two sessions. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to uh, Dr. Wu, Dr. Humphrey for kind of bookending the sessions and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. That was really, really nice. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much.